We are awfully glad to have our panelists here with us today. Uh, I'd like to introduce them one at a time. Uh, where's Russ? Right here. Oh, there you go. Thank you. You look like a student. I wore the only red shirt in the room. So. <laughs> there we go. Well, that was a brave, a brave and dicey thing to do. Uh, I'd like to ask Russ Rasmussen to join us up here. Uh, Russ, if your LinkedIn page is accurate, uh, which I hope it is, <laughs> it is. You are the director of worldwide trading for a company called Control Four. Um, you have uh, worked in the past at the LDS Church designing uh, public displays. Visitor centers, historic sites. Visitor centers, historic sites. Eleven years. San Diego, and you've been involved in Los Angeles. Yeah, right? You name it. In the last. 11 years I worked on it. You were, you were the guy. Yeah. How many have been to the Visitor Center in San Diego? The That's the best one on church. The Mormon Italian. Italian. The Mormon Italian. 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 It's Italian. It's Italian. It's the best museum on the planet. If you knew how painful it was to get done. The pictures? He is the co founder of a company called ViewWorks, and uh, he has worked at Nobel also, which uh, graduated in 2003 from this department uh, with his PhD. Okay, I'd like to invite Steve Ashton to join us. Steve uh, is a BYU graduate in 2012 with his PhD. He is the Director of Audience Research and Development at Thanksgiving Point Institute. Uh, I didn't know it was an institute, but I think that's kind of interesting. Yes, yeah, nonprofit. Um, he also has acted as Visitor Studies and Ambassador Coordinator. He's responsible for the Ambassador Program at Thanksgiving Point. He is also uh, an exhibition uh, designer, has been in the past, and an instructional designer at the, at the uh, uh, MTC. Dr. Katie Knight is with us. Come on through this way. Okay. Katie Knight is... Uh, a museum science educational professional at the Monty L. Bean Museum of uh, Natural History on the BYU campus. Graduated in 2012 from this department. Is, uh, has done some really important things with the uh, iPads up there, trying to help change the nature of the displays they have, the uh, events they have. And Kari Nelson is a uh, curator of education. <laughs> Curator of Education at the Museum of Peoples and Cultures at BYU. That's the that's the anthropology that's part of the anthropology department. Department Museum. Uh, we had an interesting experience with Kari uh, years ago. Yeah, this is how I got introduced to the department. Oh, so Kari contacted us and said, uh, "Could you help us uh, to put together a new a new kind of thing that will help us get outreach into the public schools?" And so we had the advanced design course do a project for her. And we created Polynesia in a crate. I was in that class. <laughs> and Katie was in the class. That's right. So we're, we are just really appreciative of these people. And we think they have a lot of wisdom to share about anything they want to talk about, actually. But can I, uh, can I just uh, put a little uh, seed? Uh, from time to time, I'll seed you with a question and then have each of you respond, if you will. What's the favorite museum experience you have ever designed? I'll give you a moment to think about it. OK, the moment's up. Now, uh, Russ, do you want to start us off? Sure. Well, the, the, the favorite uh, one I ever designed uh, never saw the light of day, so we won't talk about that one. <laughs> uh, Couple years of pain and it never ever came to that. Came we to want to hear about that one. <laughs> I could even show you pictures if I had uh, <laughs> thought about it earlier. But the one that actually saw the light today was the Morgan Italian Historic Site. Um, if you had been there previous to 2000, and I think it was 10 that we opened it, uh, it was uh, special. We called it the funeral parlor because of some um, <laughs> nice features of it. Uh, but we we took about, um, I don't know, it was about two, two and a half years, and we wanted to turn it into an experience as opposed to a stand in front of a kiosk experience. And so, um, ended up having to uh, 
<laughs> well, just spent a lot of time designing around that specific. What we did was we first built a story, and the story was obviously about the Mormon Battalion, and then uh, we built the experience around there. And that experience changed quite a bit over those two and a half years, um, mainly because we <clears throat> originally thought we were going to have more space, but then the city of San Diego decided they didn't love us because of Prop 8 and some other things, and uh, so we um, got to adjust our, our building space. But in the end, it, it came out, I, I'm, you know, I'm one of those that I have a hard time going through it because I see all the things we didn't do and had to pull out and all that stuff that goes on, but it, it's had a, we've had a great reaction. All of the fourth graders in the county come through the Mormon Battalion, not just our building, but the Mormon Battalion, I mean, pardon me, the uh, uh, Old Town experience down there. And so it, it uh, used to be the case that they were a little leery of coming by our building because it looked like a funeral parlor and because it was, um, just the message was not appropriate for them. And so uh, this redesign, before we launched it, we pulled in about 50 educators and had them go through the experience because we wanted to know if there was anything that they were going to be offended by. <clears throat> and we'd been told for years that you can't, uh, you can't talk to these people about the gospel because it's offensive. And um, the way we ended up telling the story was we talked about the gospel a ton, but we talked about it just simply telling our story. And, you know, we brought them in and didn't have a single person out of those 50 that were, that was offended, had anything that they thought we would change. Uh, had a couple members that were offended, but that was okay. <laughs> we, were, we were okay with that. Uh, but it, it's, in, it's been a fantastic sight. My, you know, they think I had something to do with this, like I sit down with the apostles and tell them what to do. But um, my sister and my parents both went to serve there. And uh, my parents just got back about a, about a year ago. Great experience. Marvelous. Steve. So uh, there's two that come to mind. One, one I had a lesser of a role, and that's the Museum of Natural Curiosity. Uh, that opened up in May of 2014 at the Thanksgiving point, and uh, we've just been thrilled about it. And I was involved in some of the initial design at the beginning, but then other people kind of took over, and I was involved at the very end as well. So that one was, was really fun, uh, but one that's really memorable was when I was a student here and I was in the advanced instructional design class, and we did a project for Thanksgiving point called NASA Blast. And there was a traveling exhibit gallery, and we were having a bunch of exhibits coming in from the Exploratorium, which is a hands-on science center in San Francisco, and all of these exhibits were about light. And our class was given the assignment of how do, you, how do you find a theme for all of these things regarding light and how do you make it fit with the potential NASA grant that Thanksgiving Point was hoping to receive. Uh, and so we ended up doing this, what I thought was a really fun project related to tying all these light exhibits into space exploration and then building an entire theme around it, uh, including a fictitious family called the Andersons that helped people to go through the experience and helped immerse them in um, in the whole room and in all the exhibits. And we, Thanksgiving Point, ended up getting the grant, and it, which made it more exciting. And it was really fun. It was there for an entire year before it switched out with another exhibit. My turn. I have so many ideas. Um, let's see. I loved my dissertation project. I thought that was really fun, um, but I, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's a, it was an iPad dichotomous key type thing that students could, could do uh, in the museum and identify species. But I think my favorite was probably tie between putting together a display on stewardship, um, earth stewardship, and also one that Mark's currently helping us with, Mark Ware, um, who's in the uh, program right now, on. We haven't figured out a title yet, but it's on all things to know if there's a God and it's going to be addressing a very controversial issue of science and religion and ways of knowing. And, and that's just exciting to me because we're doing a lot of, Mark's doing a lot of background evaluation for that and um, really trying to get at the heart of misconceptions and, and you know, what people think. And we have to be very careful about it because there are so many differing opinions on it. And so that one's just exciting because it's 
finally, like, we're just going to hit it head on and, and do it the way I think we should do it. At the Bean Museum, we could talk about science and religion because that's what we do there. Um, you wait to catch That's very easy. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry. Um, well, probably um, my favorite project, it wasn't necessarily the design aspect of it, but the interpretation aspect of it because we have students um, designing the exhibits at the Museum of Peoples and Cultures. And um, under. Speak to that person. Okay, so we have at the Museum of Peoples and Cultures, we have students designing the exhibits and then also creating the um, educational approaches and, and interaction that visitors will have with them. And part of my job is to mentor that um, and to help students, you know, use um, good instructional practices in the things that they put together to share with the visitors. So um, this experience really made me feel like, yes, success. Uh, we had an exhibit of Mexican dance masks. They're very traditional, go way back to Aztec and even earlier times. Um, some of them are pretty freaky looking, just ghoulish demons. Um, some of them are just, you know, odd animals or things like that. And a lot of times when school kids would come in, their first reaction would be like, yeah, these are freaky. And then um, after, as they're leaving, they had a totally different attitude towards these masks. They had an appreciation for the way they were used, for the people who made them. And if you said, which one of these would you want to take home and hang on your wall? They could choose one. And so clearly they didn't think it was freaky anymore. And I felt like we did our job. That was some, some good instructional design there to help. And then their mom would see it hanging on their wall yeah. and say, oh, that's freaky. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully then at that point they had a good enough experience at the museum that they could go home and help their mom understand that it wasn't. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, Kari, let me start with you and we'll work our way back across. Uh, a question for all of you to consider is, uh, is the work that you do, do you consider to be instructional <coughs> and if so, how is it different from the traditional definitions of instructional design that most people carry around in their heads who are instructional designers? Okay. Do we have the slides? Okay. Um, I think this is what it boils down to. And, um, Informal learning, a lot of times the, um, the responsibility for learning is put on to the learner as opposed to the instructor. So I saw this quote, well actually it's in this. This is a book that I had to have for Dr. West's 520 class, I think, and there's a chapter on informal learning in here that if you've got this book, I think it's worth reading um, that chapter if you want to learn a little bit more about informal learning and the different contexts that it is, exists in. But I think it kind of boils down to this. Winston Churchill said, personally, I'm always ready to learn, but I do not always like being taught. So in the context that I feel like I'm doing instructional design, um, it kind of has to be, um, I, I don't know, is this the right way to say a spoonful of sugar approach? So that um, you know, you're not standing up there um, lecturing or even making it obvious that people are learning something but somehow what you're designing is so engaging that um, they're motivated to learn on their own. Sometimes the informal learning is also called free choice learning, and that's, that's a really good descriptor of it, too. Okay. <coughs> so repeat your question again. I'll make sure I'm right. Is, do you consider uh, what you do when you're designing for a museum? Uh -huh. Do you consider it to be instructional design? And uh, if so, how is it different from the the general image that, for instance, all these people might have about what instruction is. Okay, because of the museum setting. Yeah. Okay. Well, basically what Kari said, but the thing I would add to it is that um, with museums, you have to be very careful in how you design things because, because it is free choice and informal. If you have too much text or, or too much um, of one content or one in, a bunch of information that's all the same, they get bored and they just move on. And so they might not have the experience. And so the goal is, is to have them have an emotional experience 
that um, will help them remember what they're learning. And so you have to you have to really look at how um, visitors and patrons react to things initially to get them pulled in, and that's always um, a struggle, especially at our museum because our content is scientific, and so we have professors over in the life science building come over all the time and tell us that we're dumbing it down and why are we doing this and they want 500 word labels and and then we're like no one knows what that word means and no one will read it no one will, no read, one it. will read it but they constantly yeah they battle they that's just an ongoing battle but um our average visitor is a fourth grader so we can't we have to kind of figure out ways to to um engage the visitor on one level, but then if they want to go deeper, this is one thing technology can do, is, they, is we can put in different ways to make the level and the, uh, the content go deeper if they want with a QR code or a device of some kind and they can learn more. So I, I'm kind of going to turn that question on its head a little bit and say that in the museum field, when you look at job postings, I don't think you'll ever see a posting where they say, we're looking for instructional designers. That, that's just, in the museum field, that's not, that's not very well known. Uh, however, the skills that you develop as an instructional designer fit perfectly with, with exhibit design and evaluation. Uh, that's something that I noticed. So that the, the team of, the, the internal creative team that we have at Thanksgiving Point is made up of people one focuses on art, one focuses on uh, the exhibits, one focuses on education, one is our VP, I focus on uh, evaluation. But all of those things together, I think, allow us to design really uh, great experiences. The other thing I would mention um, regarding the instructional design, I, I'm totally with Katie on this, where sometimes people have this idea of, okay, a museum is all about content. We want to we want to give content that this museum has, we want to give it to the people. But museums uh, have changed over time, and in the past they were very traditional, saying the museum is the authoritative figure on this content, and we're going to give that to you. Very much cognitive way of looking at things. But now, lots of museums are transitioning to a more constructivist way of looking at things. Instead of having specific content knowledge that you're supposed to learn, it's, it's your choice, it's open-ended. So at Thanksgiving point, when you go to the Museum of Natural Curiosity, there's lots of different outcomes that can, uh, that can happen when you interact with the exhibits. We're more interested in the process of the learning rather than on specific areas of content knowledge uh, with the learning. That was it. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> That's it, period. Steve and I have worked on a few things. Um, for me, I'll talk to um, uh, my uh, experience with uh, designing for the church, and then, well, I'll tell you about my current one. I, I deal with home automation, and um, <clears throat> the thing that's been so dang fun about this job, I've only been there six months, is in my interview, uh, I got asked the question, what exactly is instructional design? <laughs> <laughs> By the training department. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there is so much work to do, because nobody had any foundation or skill in that regard, and so, uh, it's been a lot of fun to um, be putting some wrappers around that. And the piece of that that's been a little different than the traditional model I learned, at least, because I don't know what you guys are uh, explore here, but um, the Addy model does not work in a technology environment. It just doesn't. It's too long, it's too slow, it costs too much, and it just kills the process. Um, you know, we're kicking out new software and new product every six months and we have to be able to be uh, to adapt to that. So we have spent a lot of time working with, um, I think it was Allen Communications or Michael Allen or somebody, the, the, uh, the SAM model, the Successive Approximation model, uh, is what we've been working with specifically because that helps us to iterate and, uh, and cycle through our, our instructional, uh, pardon me, our um, certification development uh, in a much faster, better way. So. On the visitor center historic site side, um, the thing that was challenging is I, I moved into that environment having, um, I, I was doing instructional design for Novell and other high tech companies, so I was writing about software and hardware and that kind of stuff, and then I got put in the middle of the environment where I needed to be designing experiences, and not just designing experiences, but the killer 
that you and I have talked about was, and that's different than museums is, well, most museums is, we have very little tangible stuff to work with. Everything we were talking about for the most part was intangible. We want to teach you about faith, fantastic. How do you build an experience around that? You know, so uh, as, I, as I came to, to learn, that was a very challenging thing to do. Um, but we followed, we followed a similar model in the instructional design world in the sense that we had what we called key messages or learning objectives, because for some reason we say learning objectives and everyone would lose focus. So, so we call them key messages, whatever, that didn't even mean anything either. But, so, but we would use that and then we would usually try to target how to get an intangible concept connected to a tangible thing, kind of like the Savior did as well. With, you know, uh, parables and allegories and things, and and uh, we learned a lot from President Packer in that regard. So that was that's how we tried to design. What was in that process, and and come to find out, there uh, we joked about it up at the church that there there's uh, there are more instructional designers up there than you know just regular employees. You know, there are a dime a dozen. <laughs> Someone says they have a PhD, and you go, yeah, so there'll be another 40 people. <laughs> um, but. What I came to find was uh, it was hard to find instructional designers who could be creative. There's a lot of great instructional designers that will use a subject matter expert and can take content and form it in a good way, but to be creative about that in terms of the interaction and the experience <coughs> um, takes some development. So. I wonder if uh, there are some questions that we have from the group that's here, audience. Yeah. I have a quick follow-up question for Russ. Um, so you mentioned a lot of people have a difficult time with the creativity aspect. Have you seen many people like learn how to be creative, and how did that happen? If you did see that, well, I, t I tried to figure that out because uh, we needed help. And even going out, you know, um, uh, Stephen knows this. We we would work with a lot of uh, external um, exhibit designers specifically, but come to find out. They're great at drawing, but not great at designing. <laughs> so uh, here's the only thing I can say, and I don't know if this is even helpful, but if you love that environment and you love the subject that you're talking about or whatever it is, that that passion comes through in your wanting to reach out and look at every resource you can to try to get ideas and, and be inspired by things that other people are working on. I mean, I can't tell you, in 11 years, I probably went through you know, 60 museums all over the world just looking for ideas and thoughts and little pieces of, of, of ways that people would do things. And when I would find people that had that hunger, man, we'd hang on to those people because you can't, that's one of those things that's hard to teach. It just comes from this desire to want to create and be involved in that process. That's probably not helpful at all, but that was the best I got. We, we've had, uh, at Thanksgiving point, we've tried to develop a culture of creativity where a lot of the things that we learned in this advanced instructional design class about <coughs> brainstorming, about being non-judgmental about people's ideas, just coming up with lots of ideas, referring judgment, and building on each other's ideas, we, we found that we had to practice that at Thanksgiving point. But when the more we practiced, the more open people became so that I feel like we have a really creative department and a really creative culture at Thanksgiving point where ideas are open. So I, I kind of feel like people all, everyone has the potential to be creative, and I think that sometimes we feel like we can't because we're worried about what other people are going to think. But when there's that more open dialogue and culture, I think great things happen as a result. That's great. What, can I add one little thing to that? Yeah. We would, um, I, how do I say this nice? Uh, if people were in meetings like that and would be like, oh, you can't do that, that's not possible, we would invite them to exit because I hated that kind of stuff when someone would say, oh, you can't do that. And I'd say, have you tried it? No. Okay. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that. Um, I, I think it's kind of a technique in the Stanford D school, like the but versus and kind of conversations. You're like, hey, what if we do this? And the person you're talking to says, but you know, this would result in whatever. And instead, you're challenged to have these conversations of, what if we did this? And the person you're talking to is like, and we could <laughs> do that. And we could do that. And you, you just build up and up and up and up. And you might have to like scale back, but like no ideas are stifled. You just keep adding to each other's ideas. And then 
it comes to something that's that's doable but also like really creative and maybe something that you haven't thought of before. I can speak to that a little bit too. Our um, exhibits committee is is small and it's it's full time employees um, that have been doing exhibit design for years and doing it very traditionally and basically saying when I first got there they'd say we're going to put these heads on a wall and we need you to write a label you know that <laughs> and and then I just you know slowly have tried to incorporate some of the principles that I learned in this program and. Um, one of the things that I've learned at the Bean Museum and at BYU is that the students that work for me are my greatest resource. And although they're not in those exhibit committees um, meetings, I'll take them to my own meetings with them and I'll say, hey, we're going to work on a new exhibit like this and just let them brainstorm like crazy. And then I'll take their ideas and um, back to that other committee and it opens up a new world. Work it into the old tradition. Right. Yeah, <laughs> they tell me, but you can't do that. So now are the animal heads winking and stuff? Like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should see. <laughs> they talk to you. They, they turn talk. tired. <laughs> yeah. This is nice. like this. Other questions? Yeah, back. Yeah. Um, I'm curious kind of what principles or frameworks have been helpful for working with a physical space and kind of the challenges and opportunities of a, of a unique physical space? Can you guys use the microphone back there when you talk? Oh, yeah. You're okay. Sorry. You're okay. Sorry, but that, that's one of my favorite parts uh, <laughs> because th this idea of uh, I don't know. I, I always had a hard time with with the, like traditional public school curriculum and having papers and, and and you're in a traditional setting. I just had a hard time with that. But I love the idea of you've got a space and you get to fill it up with a whole bunch of stuff. I don't have any good good suggestions regarding the framework, except to say that I love the idea of, of allowing people to go into a space and be immersed in a new experience, in a new environment. Disney does it all the time. They, they're not educationally focused, but when you go to any of the Disney parks, you get immersed in the experience. And I think that museums have the same ability to do that, and but tie in that educational component as well. I give you one thing. Prototype, 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 yes, yes, prototype, yes, yes, prototype. Yes, yes, yes. It amazed me how many people would sit in their chair and never get up and get in space. And you get in that space and then I hear this excuse, well we don't have money to prototype. I'm like, you know how to buy cardboard? You're good to go. Right? <laughs> Whatever you can use that helps you figure out how that space works. I, we designed a space at Portland Temple Visitor Center, you know, they gave us a closet to put a visitor center in. And uh, then they said, yeah, we'd like you to add, put all this stuff in there. And man, it was spatially challenging. And we set that thing up with cardboard and wood and other things in our back exhibit office, maybe 20 times, and walked through it and tried things and figured out where chairs were. I mean, just all the stuff that went along with that. For me, that was critical. If you didn't do that, you were going to fail. Kenny and Kari, I want to pose the same question to you, but ask uh, how, we know how traditional museum spaces are used. They, they tend to be like library shelves with things you can't touch, Do not touch on the it. shelves. How, how does this idea of creating a user experience and using a space for that, how is that going to evolve in traditional museums? How's that going to change? Well, technology has a lot to do with it, and um, using your docents is, is very um, helpful, too. We have, we call them curiosity cards. I mean, it's not a new idea, but our docents will bring them out, and they'll have stuff that, that the kids and visitors can touch um, and feel, and, and we have an iPad attached to it, and they play matching games and all kinds of things and learn more and watch videos, and so... It's, uh, it, it'll evolve, but we're, we're not there yet. It, the Museum of Natural Curiosity, if you've been there, it's, it's like an amazing playground, and you get to actually be in every area. I wish we could do that at ours. It's, it really is do not touch <laughs> everywhere. And, and that's because our, um, we are the traditional museum where the collections are valuable, and we pull certain things out, um, scientifically valuable and, and monetarily. Um, and you just can't let people ruin them. And so you have to sort of morph them together and create like, um, what's the word, sort of fake experiences with fake 
with uh, falsified, or fabricated, there you go, <laughs> fabricated um, exhibit places like our, um, I don't know if you've been there since we've remodeled, but we have this new children's area where they can go in and, and go up a tree and go down a slide and then in a bear cave and that's all just fabricated but it's to help kids learn and think about where animals live and the different, the different places. And, if you go in the bear cave, there's actually a, a mounted bear head in there. The eyes glow. It's really funny to watch the kids come out screaming. <laughs> but anyway, that's just it creates an experience, and if, even if those kids are like a little bit scared, they're going to remember the bee museum and, and the bear cave. So I don't know if that's answering your question or not. Yeah, it is. Well, I think that's really a challenge that a lot of traditional <coughs> museums have because they see the popularity of places like the Museum of Natural Curiosity and these places that. Um, you know, aren't necessarily collections focused, but it's an informal learning place. Um, and so it's a very untraditional museum. And in just this kind of generation of expecting um, participatory experiences, um, uh, collections based and collections focused, like research museums, traditional museums, really struggle with maintaining their kind of research and scholarly, um, I don't know, standing or position, and yet we, our visitors are a lifeblood, and if we can't show that we're having impact on our visitors, then we really struggle to get funding and support that way. Um, so it is, I don't know if I necessarily have an answer for that, but that is something that I see like um, in the listservs, in the literature, in the conversations, that there's, where do we find that balance of being taken seriously for like what we know and still like making it accessible and inviting and, um, you know, like museums really do not like the word edutainment, um, but it's something that like, okay, well, what else are we gonna call it then? Because that's what a lot of people feel like they need to do. So those of you who are in the, in the 664 course now, the advanced design course, know that we're talking about this idea of paradox. That's her paradox. It's, it's a situation that's holding things in a fixed state, the expectations of the, of the academics and the wants and the desires of the persons who want to come to the museum. They're locked together and, and they kind of keep the museum where it is. And it, it's hard to change it. That paradox is what a designer has to disentangle. And I'm not on the panel, so I gotta stop it. <laughs> uh, but that was a very interesting example of something that gets a practice that gets locked in place. And somehow as a designer we have to understand how to unlock things so that they move toward the user and the user's needs. Now everything that you guys have been saying up to this point has to do with the user experience, the design of experiences, rather than of media pieces or even spaces. What are the principles of user experience design that you think get to the heart of designing an effective experience? Uh, I'll say that one of them is uh, what's called empathy mapping, or uh, this is, I think, a part of prototyping as well. But it's where you actually go to a space and you do lots of, lots of observations and you find out what people really are experiencing. And rather than just, like Russ was talking about, just designing things in a box and then just putting out there expecting people to really uh, do, do with it what you think they're going to do with it. People so often don't. So it's, you've, got to, you've got to try it out and then you have to watch it and you have to participate in it. <coughs> Uh, so there's a lot of the give and take and the evaluations this major component all along the process. I would say evaluation is a huge thing. Um, and the, what I spoke about earlier with that exhibit on faith and science, Mark's doing a front end evaluation um, very uh, formally, but he's done it so far with our exhibits committee and it's been fascinating. And just to find out where we are, um, where we stand in our, our small little committee, so many different views right there, and to get us on the same page has been difficult, but then he's gonna go out and get 
get more information from the public, from the science professors that are, that are connected to the museum, from all of the stakeholders that we can come up with, the donor, there's a donor that actually gave money for this and what her expectations are. And so that evaluation and then the prototyping with that and coming up with, with the real heart of, of this exhibit and then designing it. So just really finding out the topic that you're going to address with evaluation. Yeah, that's what I, both of those, I would, I would totally echo, um, and not just because Dr. Williams is my committee chair, but the <laughs> evaluation piece is, is so important, like, at, at every stage, you know, like what Mark's doing with the front end, we kind of um, understand where your visitors are coming from, and then formative, um, right in the middle, like, uh, I'm going to be doing, for the first time, almost um, like a user experience one because it is a, a formative evaluation on a digital interactive in a gallery and I think I guess we'll use think aloud protocols and sit down with the visitor and see where they're entering and what modules they're going to and things like that so um, to know what they're going to do in the end um, or you know for the next iteration of that um, and then this afternoon, actually, Jackie and I are going over for somewhat of a summative evaluation, um, if there's such a thing, of the um, historic exhibits that are at the end of the Provo City Center Temple open house and seeing how visitors are using those. And it's not like they're going to change that because the open house is ending next week, but hopefully we'll be able to provide the designers and the church history department with information that will help them feed into the next um, designs that they create for other open houses. Um, but then the user empathy, too. Um, so I'm going to pick on Jackie again, because so, we just hired Jackie at the Museum of Peoples and Cultures to help us with exhibits. Um, she's brand new there, and Monday morning we didn't have a um, student to take some preschoolers around. <laughs> Jackie shows up, and I'm like, guess what, Jackie? We get to do this today, but I'm hoping that it, um, it kind of gave her some empathy for how people are using that space and are using the um, exhibits, and because you're not just doing something on a screen or in a textbook or in a classroom, like they're physically in this space that you have designed. Um, so empathy and evaluation, I think, are the two big principles that I would emphasize. Yes. When you were wrestling with the San Diego Visitor Center design, Italian design, how how did you go about designing an experience? Well, we, we started with those key messages, and uh, and then from there we had a we had a story developed. So we worked with the historical department and uh, and and a writer to help write a story for us, and we used that storyline to really drive. That experience because we knew we wanted to we started with the premise of we don't just want to tell them an experience we want them to experience it themselves as if they were part of the town so initially the design was frankly we were going to use um, RFID keys in enlistment papers and everyone that came in got enlistment papers and then the videos and stuff would interact with them as you know a member of the battalion um, Occasionally budgets get cut, so. <laughs> but that, that's the process we worked through. So we, we looked at a lot of design things out there and we, we used that, uh, that process. Now, one of the challenges we had is we, we did set this up multiple times and prototype it and then even when you get done, uh, it's still not perfect because you see people trafficking through in a different way than you had seen your, 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 the people that you prototyped through it. Um, so we have some activities in the back. We have some gold panning, and we had some brick making, and and a couple of those we had to adjust after the fact, just because they didn't quite work. Uh, well, kids, you know, they're, little, they're not predictable, so it's a little different than they like that. I don't know if that answered your question. So, so what I hear from all of you is that uh, the emotional response that you get from your visitor is a big part of what you're designing too. It is because they only remember about 2% of what you tell them. No, I, that's it. I have no... Just, it's, just, it's just, we found that well, you would do something awesome and you think, this is, they're going to look at this and then they're going to think about this and go through this. And they get done and you go, what did you think? And they go, oh, it was 
great. You know, it, it boiled down to how they felt at the end of the experience. And so, so we did start designing more of that and using a ton less text and, you know, just the things that went along with that. It was hard to get their attention and, uh, and have them walk out of that. Can I, can I tell a quick story that is related to this? Where I went to Albuquerque and went to the Museum of uh, Nuclear Science. Or, uh, I think that's what it was. Um, and anyway, they, in the museum they talk a lot about uh, the nuclear bombs and the Manhattan Project. But I remember going into the gallery and then just being faced with this giant wall of text. And then I just started, I started reading and I thought, this is so unapproachable if you are not a nuclear physicist. <laughs> and they're talking about concepts. I thought, I feel like I'm an intelligent person, but I have no idea what they're talking about here. And I, I think I know what the Manhattan Project is, but they're not telling me any more about it. They're just assuming I already know a lot about it. And I just thought, they, they are totally distancing, distancing themselves from a regular visitor. And how, I mean, if... Anyway, I, I, it was an eye-opening experience for me to realize how important it is to understand your visitor before you start to develop something. Yeah. That's, this is incredibly good. Um, <laughs> okay, we've got a few minutes left, and I'm going to ask uh, you guys to use your imaginations uh, for, for the organization that you're currently designing for, or what have you designed for in the past. If you could have a dream project, wild, wacky, out of the box, no holds barred, no cost limitations, what would you design? What would you design, for instance, for the Museum of Peoples and Cultures? This is your dream project. Now, what were we saying about how to develop creativity? I need that right now. I'll write it on the top of my head. Um, Um, well, I think it would have some sort of like field trip associated with it. How about a time machine? Yeah, like a, a time machine I think would be really neat. So, um, you know, to, to give objects more context. You can't do that. You know, when you, I guess this is a topic in museums too, is like looted objects, and the huge problem with looted objects is they have no provenience, no provenance, and in some ways, like, a lot of objects on display are like that to a visitor because they haven't been on the archaeological site and seen all these maps and seen the context that they're, these objects are found in. Um, so yeah, a time machine would be really neat to say like, look, somebody's using that whistle that we saw in the case. I would go to the museum for that. Okay. <laughs> Katie? I would create the movie Night of the Museums, <laughs> where, the, where the animals come alive and the kids can actually be right there, ride the elephant. Or, I, I don't know if, if, if you could create something where they, they're actually in an African safari and they're, I don't know, that's, that's what I would do. Dum -dum for dum -dum. <laughs> so the mission of Thanksgiving point is to cultivate transformative family learning. We've often thought, what does that look like? with the history museums, and what does that look like with the art museum? We, uh, we would love, or I, I would love to have a, have a history museum that focuses on interactive elements uh, of things that promote transformative learning and promote family learning. Uh, I would love a, to create a museum of American patriotism and allow people to, inter uh, I don't know, pretend like they're a part of some great war, like World War II or something, and just understand the great privileges to be American. Interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. Well, I had about 600 things I wanted to do. Um, so there was a lot of them. I, I actually uh, came down a few times on campus here to work with um, groups, and the, Jeff Sheets is the overseer, I can't remember the name of the group, but he just moved from it. But, uh, the Laycock Center. What's that? The Laycock Center? The Laycock Center, thank you. Uh, and, and one of the one of the things we brought to them, and we ended up 
taking this project to a certain point. They had been working on something about the Book of Mormon, about getting people into it, and how to just get them to, to be witnesses of just even one page of this thing, you know. And, and I, I had the idea, we were um, working on a new design for Temple Square, and um, we always talk about the Book of Mormon and how it talks about Christ and all those things, and I wanted to visually see that. I wanted to see a wall that was completely, whether it was projected or we had a whole, you know, LED set up for every word in the Book of Mormon is printed, and then they could come up and have a way to interact and see through a touch of a series of buttons or interactions that they do um, to see every word in the Book of Mormon that talks about Christ or about faith or about repentance, and then get to record their own witness about those types of things. So uh, part of the Lake Talk project we did, we went to several places in the world, and, and basically we set up these little uh, exhibit experiences and had people come up. We said, said hey, we just uh, want to know if you <coughs> would, uh, would do this little, I don't know, we didn't call it a survey, but we'd hand them a page of the Book of Mormon. Sometimes they'd ask what it was. We'd tell them it was a religious text. We said, you know, you've maybe heard about God, those type of things. We just want you to review yourself, and with this red pen, mark everything that you see in there that talks about God, that uses God's name. And they would do that, and we'd say, great, can we use your name? Sure. So they would become the witness for page 42 of the Book of Mormon. And so we started stacking up these number of witnesses for every page of the Book of Mormon to allow people to participate in this experience. So, you know, simple things like that. I always wanted to, and we really tried to do this for Rome, but <clears throat> it didn't happen, is develop a, a tree of life experience so that someone's walking through the Lehi's dream and having those experiences and teaching those principles of the gospel along the way. You know, Indiana Jones stuff, let's, let's, you know, let's give us a little faith walk experience. And, and that um, there was an exhibit I saw, Stephen sent me to a museum in um, Chimney Museum. And in, in associated with that, I went to this historical uh, society and they had kind of this really cool concept, which was you walk up and there was a picture, an old photograph on the wall, and um, and then there was, uh, if you've seen those water curtains that you can project on, so the mist curtains, so they were projecting the same photo there, and they there was uh, there was someone there, a docent, that was, you know, giving you a little bit of history of what this picture was about, and they said, go ahead and walk through an experience. So you walk through that mist curtain, and you'd get a pressure sensor, and doors would open, and then you would step into that picture, and they had live actors, acting out that experience, and they would not break character, man. We tried everything. They wouldn't break character for anything, but I wanted to do that with the Book of Mormon, have people step into the pages of the Book of Mormon and experience those kinds of live experiences. So, Sorry, I get a little animated about it. There was a lot of cool stuff to do. <laughs> uh, we're out of time, but uh, we wish we had uh, double the amount of time, because... So thank you very much.